Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our presenter for this evening, Katie Carlson. She serves as the Director of Wellness Initiatives for the Marion County Sheriff's Office in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is responsible for the implementation, execution, and oversight of the Marion County Sheriff's Office wellness programs. She also serves as the coordinator of the Marion County Sheriff's Office peer support team. Recently, Katie was honored with the Emerging Leader in Crisis Intervention Award from the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation for her work in peer support and holistic wellness for public safety personnel. Before assuming her current role, she served as the public information officer for the Marion County Sheriff's Office for nearly eight and a half years. Carlson is a certified yoga teacher through City Yoga, earning that distinction in 2019, and a certified mindfulness teacher, which she earned through the Engage Mindfulness Institute in 2022. She teaches yoga and mindfulness meditation to law enforcement, corrections, and public safety personnel, to inmates in the county's adult detention center, as well as for members of her Garfield Park community in Indianapolis. She is a writer and frequent presenter on the topics of yoga, mindfulness, and public safety. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. I'm happy uh, to be here and presenting today um, on this topic. I'm going to go ahead and share. Actually, I think um, let's start doing a few rounds of straw breathing. I wanted to make sure I'm going to this is a presentation. It's probably an hour long presentation. And since we don't have that amount of time and I want to leave time for discussion and um, perhaps a little bit of practice, um, I'm going to probably go through it fairly quickly. And I want to make sure that we're including um, some practice. And I'd like to do that at the beginning and uh, perhaps again at the end of the call, even though that wasn't a um, part of the original conversation or part of the original presentation. So um, let's just prepare for a few rounds of straw breathing um, by finding uh, an uplifted seat, allowing our hands to fall comfortably in our lap or by our sides. And with straw breathing, what we'll be doing is we'll breathe in for a count of four and we'll breathe out for a count of eight through pursed lips as if we're breathing out through a straw. Um, and we'll start with a big exhale together. We'll probably do about four rounds of this. And I just want to add that if um, this breath count for in eight out is not a comfortable breath count for you, you're welcome to modify it in way that it does feel comfortable for you. That's three and six out or five and and 10 out. So uh, my account is our suggestion, but let's just settle into our seat and into this call with a few rounds of straw breathing. So we'll start with an exhale together. And then starting to breathe in two, three, four, out through pursed lips, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, breathing in. Two, three, four, out through pursed lips. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathing in. Two, three, four, out through pursed lips. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathing in. Two, three, four, out through pursed lips, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and returning to our normal breath. Before we move on, just taking a moment to notice any changes that straw breathing may have um, given to our body, anything that we might notice, any um, differences between our state before and after, just being conscious of the power of a few breaths and what they can um, do to our body. So I will share my screen now and dive into the presentation. There are several um, points in time that I would uh, love to have um, participation. And so even if you um, can't see me, please uh, uh, feel
There we go. Can you hear me now? Hello? Can anyone hear me or see my screen? We're good. Can see the screen and hear you. You're good. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. This presentation is called Toxic Wellness and How to Avoid It. Um, I'm going to skip anything about my background because this was all covered in Robert's wonderful introduction. Um, and I do want to add a disclaimer to this presentation that um, while my work uh, is strongly supported by my employer, the Marion County Sheriff's Office, the views in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of the Marion County Sheriff's Office. Um, so this is based essentially on some of my own uh, research and thoughts and uh, some holes that I have noticed in um, parts of wellness. So just putting that out there. So one of the first questions that I'm going to be asking, the word toxic is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as very harmful or unpleasant in a pervasive or insidious way. And uh, so I was curious what else, what kind of things we might describe as toxic. You can unmute, and then there's, you know, there's toxic waste, but uh, toxic, is, toxic is often um, kind of added to other words. Are there any um, big ones you can suggest? Um, Anyone heard of Toxic Positivity? That's a book um, that's covered by Barbara Aaron, Aaron Reich. Susan, you said might have a long lasting after effect. Is that what you mean that by toxic, about toxic? Yeah, toxic environment. Yeah, exactly. Toxic workplace environment. Um, and as I was mentioning, toxic positivity is one that sometimes, you know, people don't think about the word positivity and associate it with toxic. What Barbara Ehrenreich talks a lot about um, is her journey with breast cancer and how um, she essentially kept feeling shamed for expressing any sense of uh, fear or anger. Um, and, the, you know, that that sort of uh, toxic positivity, even in kind of a competitive workplace environment like um, in, in sales or marketing, even the kind of old term pull yourself up by your bootstraps is um, essentially uh, kind of a toxic positivity because you're expecting that people um, you know, that everyone's starting on um, an even plane. Another word that sometimes gets paired with it is uh, toxic max masculinity. And I don't say that to necessarily pick on men, but when we start to move in this direction where we talk about toxic environment, toxic positivity, um, toxic masculinity, some of these are some of the factors that can have a, a negative impact on law enforcement and public safety personnel and uh you know and and do and so that's part of the reason we're talking about um toxic wellness today so it might sound like a bit of a um ironic term uh wellness being good and toxic being bad but um where a lot of this presentation came from and i'll talk about where i found holes in this book too um was uh from i di didn't come from it what it was inspired by was a book uh, called american detox by carrie kelly um she's a yoga teacher and she says that well-being and wellness are not the same and that she defines uh, well-being is the state of being well or feeling whole and wellness is the active pursuit of well-being. And she also says that while being well-being is a human right and not a privilege, um, my well-being is not isolated and separate from your well-being. And that that means that true wellness demands that we confront everything that is in the way of our collective well-being. Um, so 
when we think of the term wellness, there um, are a lot of things that might come up, but I think one of the most comprehensive definitions is from uh, SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, and it defines eight dimensions of wellness, the emotional wellness, physical wellness, occupational wellness, social uh, spiritual, intellectual, environmental, and financial. So um, wellness is, uh, you know, made up of several different components and not just one. It's not just this physical wellness or just um, a matter of nutritional wellness. It uh, contains a lot of different, you've got environmental here that'll um, play a bit into this presentation. Um, so there are a lot of different aspects of wellness and well-being. Um, but going back to Carrie Kelly, and she talks about toxic wellness, um, she discusses a well-being gap that is the unequal conditions that determines who gets to be well and who doesn't. Um, so the premise essentially of the book and a premise I strongly agree with is that if wellness doesn't exist for everyone, then true wellness doesn't exist for anyone that essentially, um, wellness doesn't, you know, exist or true wellness doesn't exist in a vacuum or isn't something that you can just buy. And really since this presentation, there's another book that, um, I've been reading that is, uh, called, Oh, crap, and I'm forgetting the name of it. It's just right over there. Hang on one second. Uh, real self-care. And in this book, Real Self-Care, um, she talks about um, real self-care and faux self-care. Uh, this is Pooj Poojma Lakshman. Um, real self-care is, or well, faux self-care, we'll start with that. And this plays uh, very much into this uh, as well. Faux self-care is, you know, yoga, you know, multiple thousands of dollar yoga retreats. It's, uh, you know, expensive classes, expensive yoga clothes, expensive juices, a lot of stuff like that, things that cost money. So essentially, uh, faux self-care is part of a capitalist um, uh, definition of what wellness is and it is wellness that's exclusive to certain people whereas true self-care um according to dr lakshman is um stuff that essentially only you can give yourself like setting boundaries or giving yourself time giving yourself um the kind of support that you need or even putting yourself around people who support you and removing people that don't so there are a lot of things that can get in a way in the way of an individual's access to wellness resources, especially for public safety personnel and first responders. So we'll talk about a few of those things. And this is going back to some of those uh, traditional images of a toxic wellness culture. Um, so essentially being, you know, white, skinny, there's kind of expensive juices again. So um, a lot of things that seem exclusive, these people, you know, that are on this uh, page don't necessarily look like everybody else. Um, and yet they're kind of presented as what true wellness is. And this um, is counter to our presentation. But um, this is where when Carrie Kelly talks about um, toxic wellness culture. This is really, she's a yoga teacher. So this sort of background is really what she's talking about. And she discusses in her book, having, um, leaving a studio, um, in San Francisco and walking past, uh, homeless teens every day on her way out of the studio and how eventually that started to seem, um, not just kind of inconvenient for a studio owner, but felt, uh, disconnected from the true meaning of her yoga practice. So why does toxic wellness matter at all? Um, and that's really because the going back to the uh, wellness industry that I was discussing earlier, stuff like retreats and expensive clothing, um, special, you know, really special food, stuff that's not necessarily available to everyone. The wellness industry uh, came in at about $4.4 trillion in 2020 and should exceed $7 trillion by 2025. 49 billion of that came from workplace wellness. And so there are a um, lot of people who are competing for a foothold in the wellness arena. And I think that 
Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what everybody does, but I think Troy can probably, um, you know, w would understand. There's some weird options out there. You know, there are a lot of people who kind of reach out and to me and my role as wellness director, and there are a lot of products that people are selling. And it's really difficult sometimes to navigate um, those products, especially when I first came into my role as uh, the director of wellness initiatives and began the process of trying to network with other wellness personnel throughout the country. Um, there were, you know, I, I just ran into a lot of uh, sales and it was kind of difficult to figure out what was legitimate and what wasn't. And so essentially this presentation and uh, the laying out true wellness versus toxic wellness uh, is a lens with which to view uh, wellness programming for um, someone who may be looking to see what may be the best fit for their agencies. So, and I mentioned an example here um, that there are, um, you know, people that are selling wellness products, but are um, kind of cutting out aspects of wellness. So, or cutting out aspects of uh, the products. So they say, yeah, you know, we want to do breath work. And actually, I'm going to, uh, you know, there's an organization that I'm not a, a huge fan of. And, you know, they kind of just want to toughen everything up. And we're going to get uh, to that a little bit later. But this point about breath work and leaving out stuff about the emotions um, is kind of an example of that. And there was actually somebody who I talked to not really long ago. And he, by the time I had talked to him, he'd already secured a fairly significant contract um, as a wellness provider with a large um, law enforcement organization, and he'd really not worked with them very much before. And where this example comes from is that he uh, had been talking with a couple law enforcement officers and they brought him in um, and they wanted him to do this wellness, but they said, leave out anything about the emotions. And as I was talking to him, I was like, no, like you, like, like put that in, like that's, you know, you don't get to, you, you should, we don't need to pick and choose or kind of, uh, you know, decide. And, and, and the main point is that he really had not had any previous experience working with any public safety personnel and yet still um, managed to secure this contract. And that's not me. I, I hope that doesn't sound uh, bitter by any means. I'm just saying there is a lot of competition that's out there and there are a lot of different offerings. And so that's why it matters to understand what uh, you're looking for. There are several uh, factors in um, public safety wellness, one being the changing attitudes towards, towards, uh, towards public safety, um, and really that kind of uh, can have a really big effect on people and uh, create a little bit of an us, or not a little bit, but um, can deepen the, widen the us versus them um, stagnant wages and inflation have a big impact, uh, challenges with recruitment and uh, attrition, as well as understanding um, the uh, ongoing effects of trauma. And that's increased understanding of the ongoing effects of trauma. So um, these are fairly new and uh, wellness things to be able to keep up with with um, any wellness programming. So getting to the meat of the presentation, I've got three tenets of true wellness. The first of that is a, inclusivity is the key. The second is breaking through resistance with repetition. And the third is vulnerability as the pathway to resilience. So we'll start with inclusivity. And I asked earlier, how or why, what are some reasons that someone may get left out of wellness programming? And particularly if we're talking about programming within an agency, um, you know, at least at that point, money may not necessarily be a factor, although it may still be, um, you know, an access to funding um, and resources can be a really big factor um, with the general public on why some people get uh, left out of wellness wellness. Um, but in a law enforcement or public safety organization, these are some of the uh, reasons, you know, a late culture or a language um, barrier. We have 
you know, several members of the Marion County Sheriff's Office, not several, but I mean, probably close to 100 are from Nigeria. And so um, even really including any programming that um, is inclusive with them is, is a challenge, but it's certainly a reason why they might be uh, left out of wellness programming. Um, gender, if programs are particularly geared towards uh, men instead of uh, both genders, um shift and this is a really big one for me i try not to do anything for wellness at the sheriff's office that isn't available to all of our shifts so um you know that means not having this one you know yoga class at one time but creating um wellness programming and videos and um recordings that can be accessed at any time by all people or taking wellness programming like um bringing in uh one of our healthcare providers and scheduling those for all of the different shifts. Um, physical ability is another reason that uh, wellness, see someone may get left out of wellness if the only um, wellness options that are available are for a you know, high physical ability. Somebody with a lower physical ability may not find uh, that accessible. And this can vary from agency to agency depending on um, any kind of uh, physical standards that have to be kept up with. Um, and then also a comfort with technology. If you are saying, here's our, uh, actually, I just had a phone call the other day with an organization that basically has, you know, discounts at local gyms, but then they also have a program, library, a program, uh, a library of online wellness resources. And, um, you know, that's not a a, a bad thing. It was good overall, pretty redundant to a lot of other programming. But um, if somebody, if you're only offering wellness via an app on a phone, someone who doesn't have a smartphone may be left out of that. So when we talk about exclusive inclusivity um, and the reasons that we want to, uh, you know, it, be more inclusive in wellness has more to do, and I'm not going to read this um, quote um, exactly, but when we other people, um, when which is already an issue, as I as I mentioned in public safety, I've been in a training all day today, and it's come up, you know, this us versus them mentality has come up um, a lot of uh, or several times when we have this us versus them mentality or when we reinforce that us versus them mentality with um, our wellness programming, like something is just, uh, and I kind of pick on things a little bit here and I don't mean to, but you know, if you've got, you know, blue shield wellness or um, something that just seems uh, oriented uh, only to police, uh, it can, you know, enhance or, or push away this us versus them um, mentality or, you know, deep in the line anyway. And that's kind of counter uh, intuitive or contrary to what we're um, aiming for in a lot of the rest of our wellness practices, which is to be able to self-regulate and move out of the fight, flight and freeze response into the rest and digest response. So any kind of wellness programming that reinforces this othering, I find um, counterproductive. Uh, this is kind of a random tangent, but the term cultural competency comes up a lot in public safety. I really, really, really dislike this term. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, in some places it's they're kind of going, uh, you know, really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? really gravitating towards this term and in other places they're starting to move away from it. But um, while I strongly uh, believe and understand that specialized care for public safety personnel is needed um, and valid in a lot of situations, that's not necessarily the case in most situations. And so um, the basic example of cultural competency uh, being used in a way I think is harmful is to, um, it, it, it are these lists of culturally competent mental health providers and the um there there's a list and i think it's with the national fop but the last time i looked there was something like 
one in Indianapolis who was listed as a culturally competent provider. He's a great guy. I was just around him yesterday. Really, really like him. Um, and, and he does a lot of work in public safety, but he's the only one listed. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, a cultural competency kind of certificate that somebody can get, but uh, it's really unclear how anybody can sign up for this uh, certificate. So my biggest couple problems with this term cultural competency is that the term competency isn't defined by anything. Um, you know, there's not necessarily an accreditation or a certification or, you know, does competency mean that you've just had experience working with public safety personnel in the, fa in the past, which wouldn't necessarily apply to the person I was talking about earlier, or, you know, do you have to be former public safety personnel yourself. So there's, you know, a very unclear definition of what competency means in this term. And then also when it talks about culture, um, you know, this term culture, the culture that they're defining can leave a lot of people out too. So I don't believe that all people working in a public safety organization fit into a single culture. There are many, many cultures that um, uh, are, that, you know, in fact, every person probably has their own mini culture, but there are a lot of cultures that come together based on um, background that uh, are make up public safety. And, you know, when people think of this one uh, police culture, it's not necessarily, it's usually not a very, they usually have a very specific kind of person in mind, and it's usually not a very uh, diverse representation. So, Anyway, the problem with this is that we're making a smaller and smaller group of people that are culturally competent, and it makes it more difficult to access uh, wellness or mental health programming. So uh, if you're going through, if you're a public safety personnel and you're going through a divorce or you're having um, you know, financial issues, which are often the case, and especially, you know, in, in uh, a role like in peer support, like I do, these kinds of issues, they don't necessarily need a culturally competent um, mental health provider. And, you know, these are there, they can find assistance from other people. But if we keep um, using this, these sort of us versus them terms where only these people can understand us and these people aren't okay, they're not on the list. It's just uh, not very helpful and um, takes a small pool of mental health providers in the first place and makes it much smaller. So um, trauma-inclusive wellness programming is also important. Um, there was one study that showed up to 35% of police officers showing symptoms of post-traumatic stress. A lot of the more normal ones are about 20%, but honestly, I think that it's probably higher. Um, when we talk about trauma-informed care, um, it's most basically, uh, you know, Elizabeth Reeves um, describes it as universal implementation of trauma-informed care can ensure that the unique needs of trauma survivors as patients are met and mitigate barriers to care and health disparities experienced by this vulnerable population. Um, so when you have trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive wellness programming, that's inclusive of what all people, whether it is a um, someone who is, you know, has trauma and someone who doesn't have trauma. To have trauma-informed care is inclusive, but non-trauma-informed care, or sensitive care is exclusive, and you're pushing out this, you know, 20 to 35 people or perhaps making it difficult or, um, you know, triggering a stress response. So uh, a big portion of and this you know, with, with SAMHSA and then also I'll skip to Dr. Elizabeth Hopper. She talks about putting power back into the hands of the other person. And this is really a kind of central tenet of trauma informed care is creating um, opportunities to participate in decision making and choice about um, what's going to work for you. So especially in a yoga um, setting to be, create options is, you know, if this feels good, do that. If something doesn't feel good, you don't have to do it at all. Just kind of creating a lot of space for people to back out of something that's, um, you know, making them, uh, you know, that, that may not be right for them. And so, 
uh, really creating a lot of choice and decision making and allowing people to be their own best advocate is the um, approach to trauma informed care. So moving on to the second tenement, tenant, the breaking through resistance with repetition. Um, they, uh, Ryan Cohen says that with uh, over 18,000 individual law enforcement organizations where policing is primarily locally controlled, there's no unilateral police culture. And I like this quote because it kind of reinforces uh, what I was saying earlier about cultural competency. Um, he says, however, multiple studies indicate that in general, there's a set of values and beliefs unique to the police organization that, re that challenge and resist change. So um, that there is resistance in um, among law enforcement personnel is uh, uh, not, it, it, it's a fairly general or vague brush to paint. And I don't like painting any um, individuals or organizations with a single brush stroke, but um, it is part of, uh, you know, it is a challenge to overcome when providing wellness to public safety personnel. Um, so when we talk about uh, suicide awareness and, um, you know, I've been through uh, QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer. Uh, I've done that with our friend Kimball Richardson. Um, evidence suggests that asking people about suicide does not increase risk and may be uh, associated with uh, small benefits like a uh, uh, lowered suicidal ideation. Um, and while I th this is important because while it may not increase uh, the risk, it is proven that um, talking about suicide does not uh, make people, does not put the idea of suicide in anybody's mind. And an example from the Marion County Sheriff's Office on this subject, several years ago, back when I was public information officer, we had a, uh, a couple years where I think we had maybe five inmate suicides one year and six inmate suicides the other year. I mean, the number had just gone up drastically. And so, so we putting posters, spread, creating a suicide hotline, um, putting that hotline all over the jail, um, putting posters all over the jail. You really couldn't turn the corner in our old facility without seeing the word suicide. And while I can't say that um, that is what lowered, I can't say for sure that that is what lowered the numbers in pretty much all of the subsequent years. I can say affirmatively that having the word suicide all over the jail did not increase the number of suicides that we had. So when it talks about the statistics here, it's really really um, difficult to be able to capture um, what, uh, you know, doesn't happen or what people don't do. And so the reason why this is important with uh, suicide, you know, with suicide awareness and repetition is that um, it just reinforces that the more we talk about something, the more uh, normalized it will become. So that is important when it comes to wellness. And I have a, I had an example actually the other day, somebody, uh, I was uh, meeting with them and we were talking about yoga and they said, well, I might call it tactical yoga. And I said, please don't, um, you know, like you can just, you can just call it yoga. And so uh, there are a lot of words that people sometimes think should be avoided with public safety personnel, words like emotions or feeling, um, mindfulness. I've had people tell it, you know, we're here on the Center for Mindfulness and Public Safety. People say, oh, I don't know, is mindfulness or, you know, is resilience about? So a lot of different words can kind of come up as being sensitive. And I just think we should say all the words. And another example, um, uh, we were, uh, I, we're going to be hopefully getting being a therapy dog before too long at the sheriff's office and um, its handler had mentioned, well, should we, you know, call it something other than a therapy dog? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, we, let's, we just need to say therapy. So I have this example here. It's Mindful Monday. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing these uh, currently, but, um, you know, because I'm a mindfulness teacher and work at the sheriff's office and email everybody all the time, um, the word mindfulness has really come up and, and is used at the sheriff's office a lot more. So 
I'll I'll be just walking through the halls and someone will will say, it's Mindful Thursday, or will repeat that word back to me. And I think that that's just a good example of how if we don't make words bad, then uh, they won't be bad. So the last point is on vulnerability is the pathway to resistance. The queen of vulnerability is Brene Brown. And she says, vulnerability is not weakness and the uncertainty, risk and emotional exposure we face every day are not optional. Our only choice is a question of engagement. Our willingness to own and engage with our vulnerability determines the depth and of our courage and the clarity of our purpose. The level to which we protect ourselves from being vulnerable is a measure of our fear and disconnection. And then she also says, vulnerability sounds like the truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. So when it comes to this kind of culture shift that a lot of people are striving for in public safety, especially given the past um, you know, several years since 2020 and the pandemic, um, this shift towards uh, vulnerability or being open to things like therapy, mental health, uh, wellness, uh, they are all a part of a bigger shift. So Captain Aaron O'Donnell of uh, Johnson County, Kansas says, when vulnerable, we risk letting people know that we are human and need help. It is precisely in those moments that we become most connected to the people around us. If we do not open our mind to new ways of doing things, we are doomed to repeat past mistakes and become stagnant in our profession. When we embrace our vulnerability, we become free to expand our minds and think outside of the box, propelling our profession forward. So um, this, uh, you know, as Brene Brown says, you know, vulnerability is not showing weakness. It's really, it's showing strength. And, it, you know, in, in this point, and as far as a lot of people, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, this kind of larger cultural shift um, towards uh, wellness and uh, perhaps better, better mental health awareness than um, in the past, several decades, uh, that vulnerability is truly uh, key. So what won't work when it comes to uh, uh, finding wellness approaches that will work for your organization is a check the box or one size fits all approach. So if your approach to wellness is an app, then it's probably going to leave some people out. If it's a single organization or a single uh, thing or single aspect, that will probably leave some out. So the better bet is uh, to really have a multi-layered approach to wellness. And that begins with assessing and considering the needs of all the, the wellness needs of all employees, um, giving marginalized voices um, in your organization a seat at the table get, or giving them, you know, opportunities to provide um, feedback and input as to what wellness services would be uh, most useful for them. Again, this multi-layered approach to wellness. So it's not just a check the box approach, but um, you're getting kind of the, you know, several layers in to catch as many people as you can. Um, meeting employees where they are and not where we'd like them to be. One example that I love of this from the Marion County Sheriff's Office is, and, and again, you know, our uh, you know, we don't have uh, ongoing physical standards, but not too long ago, um, you know, we put a blood pressure kiosk in the wellness room and it's really used. I, it's right outside of my office. It's really used really frequently. And um, I, I love when people come in and do it. And it's an absolute, you know, it's it's totally related to wellness and yet you know it's just kind of giving people the basic needs that they want plus most people were are kind of familiar with the kiosk you know at walmart or stuff like that so it's it's familiar wellness and it's um you know approachable and accessible wellness um which is the bottom uh line to create uh implement accessible and diverse wellness programming so that is all i have um, there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will just open it up to any questions or comments. You can put your questions in, in chat or you can just unmute and shout them out.
I got to ask about the um, uh, blood pressure kiosk. Don't tell me it's one of those little uh -huh. telephone booths that you stick in the corner, shove your arm in there, and oh, okay. yep. <laughs> it works for them. That's good. Yeah, they. I mean, you know, I get I get the numbers every month, but more than anything, I see people come into our wellness room to use it. And uh, not too long ago, I was actually. Um, with one of one of those people, I think he was teasing me about something else with, um, you know, wellness or, you know, kind of my te all the all of my fuzzy teddy bear stuff in, um, you know, for with, with yoga and meditation and peer support. And uh, I said, hey, you use anybody comes into and uses the blood pressure kiosk a lot. I was like, you use well, you use our wellness services. He's like, I do, you know, so, um, yeah, no, it's it's. It's been it's been popular. So, do you have a uh, meditation group that you that you work with out there, or does it just go along with uh, with the yoga part? I teach meditation and yoga at our training academy, and then um, I, I'm excited. I'll be going out, um, and we got some dates set with Troy and. Um, we got so I have, I'm on the calendar for the Indiana Law Enforcement Training Academy, too. So that's, you know, wellness um, or that's yoga. Um, and with law, law Enforcement Training Academy, mindfulness, breath work. Troy does a lot of breath work. Um, so mostly mostly yoga with, with his group. But I teach that at our own academy, too. And then also have kind of a library of um, mindfulness meditation and resources that people are able to access. And I'm in the process of revamping that and adding more videos with um, yoga, too. Thanks, Katie. Um, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. I'm curious about... Um, working within a system and some of the approaches or strategies that you may have in order to help shift some of the mindset that may be entrenched because it, it really is talking about um it's about coming from a place of not knowing not having any preconceived determination of what people may be needing or who may be needing something um Thank you for that question. And it, you, it, you kind of, it actually reminded me of something that I forgot to mention in the presentation, which is what I don't agree about with the um, book American Detox. So if you don't mind, I'll start I'll start off with that and then veer, veer towards uh, your question, Sandy. I think they really go hand in hand. Um, this book, American Detox, where I love the premise that um, wellness uh, is, you know, unless wellness is for everybody, um, it's not really true wellness for anybody. Um, this book bashes public safety over and over and over. And I was just like, what is going on with this? Like, why? You know, I mean, I understand that it seems cool to be... Oh, you know, like you're oh okay you're you're and and there was maybe one point in time that it goes oh also you know people in law enforcement have oh you know maybe exposed to a lot of trauma too and it's like you think um so <laughs> uh you know it it, it was that really kind of disconcerting that, um, you know, while she was preaching this message of kind of inclusivity, she was pushing out um, a group of public safety personnel um, when really, you know, for wellness to be for everybody, especially in the true sense that she means we should be pulling um, everybody in. And so, um, yeah, as far, as far as I think that goes for a wellness, it's just, uh, we have done uh, a lot of what I do is guided by survey and feedback. Uh, um, and I think that that's a, you know, especially um, when it comes to talking about our peer support team, it's really helpful to understand what the people. And so that's when I talk about engaging these different um, communities and really uh, learning what works for people and what doesn't work for people. We have these conversations all the time. I And I drop things that aren't being used and put energy towards other places. And then sometimes people are like, well, I liked this. And I was like, 
like it, it you know I didn't know I, I can see how many people are watching it <laughs> um so they um it, but in 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 line with that you know one of the areas I think that's kind of kind of getting to this cultural shift that you're talking about uh, or that that you mentioned and I brought this up in my training earlier today too um you know we've we we tested and and found and surveyed that people are a lot more comfortable um referring people who they're worried about at work to peer support resources and they are necessarily saying that they would use the peer support team themselves now the people that would use the peer support team and i you know use this as one example of you know that one kind of uh vulnerability that aspect of vulnerability but um as well as you know any kind of i think seeking mental health resources or seeking help from anybody is uh you know i think we can all agree strong um both, both vulnerable and, and strong and and knowing what you need um but when we find that people are more comfortable um or willing to admit that they trust the peer support team to assist somebody that they're worried about it helps us to be able to um communicate that way and so uh we just made a change to our peer support team website where um you know you can uh submit a uh, name to the peer support team anonymously and you can even you know choose a, a member if you would like to um, have a specific person um, reach out to that individual and why that's important is because we're starting to that it's helping us move towards um, a shift where people are looking out for each other's well-being so it's not just you know it's not but like being concerned about um, another person, you know, being concerned about the people around you. And when we start getting, especially with my agency, where we just had a line of duty death in the last, uh, 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 you know, uh, just a little over a month ago, um, that sort of shift in people looking out for each other is, is a really important aspect to um, wellness and goes hand in hand with the presentation that, you know, essentially kind of we're, we're all in this together and so to be able to look out for somebody's own you know somebody else's mental health is i think raises awareness for um, knowing um, our, our own or you know it, maybe they're looking out for somebody else but perhaps somebody else is looking out for them Okay. Um, I, I partially, I think you partially answered one of my questions, but um, you mentioned that you try to make the programs accessible. Are the people who are coming to these programs, is it optional for them or is it required? How do they, the people who take the programs come to you? We don't have any um required wellness uh, you know uh, kind of these annual mental health check-ins are um, great they're becoming state law someplace I, in some places i think that that would be um amazing but uh we don't have any required wellness uh programs uh, we don't have any um set physical standards that people have to meet on a yearly basis unlike our you know the fire department or uh, I, I don't know exactly what other agencies have to meet but some of them do um some of that's the nature of uh, the responsibilities we have at the sheriff's office but um another one example of that is i had we have a really nice fitness center in our um sheriff's office and not super long ago i had somebody ask me they said could, like I don't know how to use any of the equipment in the fitness center and so we started creating kind of tours and not I actually had people that aren't really involved in any other aspects of our wellness programming who said hey I can show anybody how what how to do anything that they need to in the fitness center so when it comes to you know having 
programming available and there being a gap between what's available and what people are comfortable with. I think that that's a good example that some people just, you know, they look in there and they see all these different machines and different buttons or heavy, you know, weights and stuff like that. So just being able to go through and say, this is what this one is. This is what, oh, I really like doing, you know, the elliptical machine is a really good place to start and, you know, just showing the buttons. And so that's a, that's a way to kind of narrow or the gap um, between what's available and, and how it's accessible to people. Thank you. It seems simple, but it was, yeah, it seems simple, but I mean, it was a real obstacle and, and, and such a simple one to overcome with with people that work for us. Thank you. You know, I just wanted to reinforce, Katie, one of the things you said about the percentage of of uh, PTSD or PTSI that's experienced by staff. Uh, and I, I think it is much higher than we think in terms of, and one of the things I observed from, you know, working at the sheriff's office and, and participating in the, in the MBWR training that was done with your agency, uh, there are so many folks that come with a background of having served overseas in combat zones and really bring bring some level of undiagnosed, uh, unaddressed trauma to the job of working in the sheriff's office. Yeah, and as I mentioned, we have a large Nigerian population, even just the, the process of, you know, moving continents from, from one to the other, leaving your family, a lot of family behind, you know, stuff, stuff and uh, there, there, people have, you know, childhood, there's all sorts of stuff people can, people can come in with that's not necessarily related to a, a, a event. You know, one of the, one of a, a program I kind of have, and I'm not going to name it, but uh, that I have kind of a problem with, you know, they will say that it's yoga related and, and they put on their social media, one, they've, you know, used kind of racist memes before, and I don't like that, but then also, um, you know, they'll be like, you're doing downward facing dog wrong. And I'm just like, ew, <laughs> that's, you know, like the uh, downward facing dog can is okay to look on different on a person that does it. And if you need to have a big bend in your knees for it to feel comfortable, that's totally okay too. And so that sense like, no, you need to get your body into this particular position um, is definitely taking away that sense of, you know, any kind of sense of control or bodily autonomy that is important for um, uh, trauma-informed practices. I'll take one. Great job, Katie. Hello, uh, how are you? All right, I'm doing well. Thank Ho you. Hopefully everybody's doing as well as I am. Uh, life is good. Uh, I was just wondering something about what Robert had mentioned about these guys coming right from overseas, right on the job and pick a job, whether it's fire, sheriff, prison, corrections, you know, they're, they're yeah, they're beat up already. And I'm just wondering how reluctant are some of these guys going to be about sharing when they know that if they share the wrong thing, maybe they may get taken off the off the duty roster. You know, I, I think that's another problem we're all there's a large percentage of that going on too. That's why I love these mental health check-ins that are mandatory for everybody. I mean, if you go and you just don't say anything uh, or, you know, or like, yeah, it's fine, you know, I mean, you know, they can't make you, but you're with a professional and they're trained on how to, you know, well, just tell me some of the stuff that you've remembered from the last year or so. Um, but, you know, it's, it's 
when people are coming from overseas, for the most part, I think for most organizations, you're going to have to do a psychological evaluation to get on. So we let people get on. And, you know, with, with uh, you know, the fire example the other day, one of my friends on the fire department just told me, um, and I don't want to, you know, I mean, he just told me about a, you know, rigor mortis that he saw the other day. And, you know, it's like you get, you, you, uh, get on you, you you get a check-in before you start and then nothing for 20 years and so it just it really doesn't make any sense if you ha if you have to get a check if you have to kind of get a checkup you know so b between coming from overseas and starting with an agency you would have something most likely i think in 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 most organizations so the problem is you know, after a career, why don't we keep doing it? And, uh, you know, and then and having something like that that's universal and applies for everybody doesn't single out any person like, oh, you've had um, a particular, you know, event, like we're afraid, are you going to be okay? It's like, everybody's got to do this. So just just do it. So, you know, if, if that, that were available, I think it'd be a really you know, I think something like that would be the best uh, antidote to that.